sure that Bach would be turning over in his grave to think that his church music was turned into Dracula music, uh, of all things. Um, so yes, what we'll um, uh, look at today is, is um, Halloween and festivals beyond. So it wouldn't just be Halloween in this world history class. We'll look at Halloween in its uh, wider world historical context. So, um, well, uh, you might have lots of questions yourselves about Halloween, like where did this rather odd and strange American custom come from? Indeed, it is something worldwide that is associated with America and sort of all things American, even though it did not originate here. Um, even stranger, I suppose, is trick or treating. I think about it. You're, you're in effect going from house to house begging for candy. Um, yeah, how bizarre is that? In costume, no less. And then uh, you might also wonder how it was that Halloween was captured by that greatest of American horrors, consumer capitalism. Uh, <laughs> there you can see uh, that thing that we all didn't realize we could live without, glow in the dark cranials. Uh, just in time for this week's Halloween. Um, and just in time to clog up our already clogged supply chain on top of it. Um, so, um, we're going to find out the answers to a lot of these questions and more. But let's first look at some Halloween basics. Um, Halloween is All Hallows Eve, uh, where um, uh, hollows and evening just been contracted into Halloween. It's the evening before the hollow day, All Saints Day, November 1st, established by the medieval church as a Christian feast day to honor the martyrs and the saints. That then comes before All Souls Day on November 2nd, which is to honor all of the souls of the dead. Um, Halloween first appeared, it's true, in the British Isles, especially on the Celtic periphery, Ireland, um, uh, Cornwall, Scotland. So it's believed that on that day, the spirits are most able to come back and to visit the living. So sort of an eerie and foreboding day. Here you can see this is a picture of All Souls Day in Rome, an early 20th century picture. Now, before we go on, um, let me offer you a Halloween treat and pass these around. There's 30 candy bars of different types, so 30 in the class. Everybody can at least get one of uh, those treats. And this lecture is my gift to you of uh, this term. It's uh, just for your enjoyment, there's nothing here that's going to be on your quiz, although I think you'll find it nonetheless informative, not only about Halloween, but just about uh, world history in general. So, uh, I am going to take my boot back because it gets hot. Uh, I dress this way because this is in depth, but you can see my sis has had better days and my time got to class today with what you call on part. Uh, because this is sort of, these are uh, festivals of death that we'll be looking at uh, today. Well, already so far in this lecture, several themes are apparent. One, uh, the honoring of the dead, veneration of the ancestors, anxieties about ghosts that um, and the coincidence of these festivals of the dead with the autumn harvest. Always a period of the year that's associated with winter, death, and decay as plants start to die. Uh, the origins of uh, most of the festivals that people celebrate the world over did in fact originate in the pre-modern period, often in, in conjunction with the growing seasons. Um, and, the challenging, and the challenges that are posed by farming in a hostile weather. And a belief in a world in which you don't think of weather as just simply a meteorological phenomenon, but that weather itself is willful, that nature is comprised of uh, beings uh, who might be up to no good, 
and responsible for the problems they're having in Karma. Um, well, as we're looking at the uh, at the autumnal festivals, Halloween included, for contrast, let's look at spring quickly. Spring is another period of the year that's ripe for uh, festivals. In this case, um, um, dealing with the passage of death to life. So you think about Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Jewish Passover, uh, passing over the angel of death in Egypt, and freedom from slavery, which is sort of, uh, you might think of as, as a way of speaking about life, as moving from death to life. Uh, Zoroastrian fire festival, I mentioned that last time, in Persia. Now there you can see the reveler jumping over the bonfire in Iran, banishing of winter in February. Originally a Zoroastrian festival that Islamicized once Iran became, uh, was converted to Islam. We have the Chinin festival. You see in a minute the ghost month is, is when the, the, the dead visit the living. Here the living go visit the dead. Clean out the tomb. So you can see in the upper right hand corner. Um, there's carnival in the Catholic countries. Here you can see the background of this that's Mardi Gras. See where it go. Pass around. This is um, people dress up in costumes, celebrate. This happens just before the start on Fast Tuesday, before the 40 days of, of, of uh, fasting and long before Easter. And then you have Purim. And then the lower right, that's a Jewish festival celebrating the spring. Um, this celebrates the, uh, with the book of, uh, of the plot of the Persian king allegedly to exterminate Jews told up in the book of Esther. So you see again people dress up in costumes, kind of a carnival atmosphere, people light off noisemakers in synagogues, and so forth. So, um, let's look at the autumnal festivals. That's spring from life to death, uh, excuse me, from death to life. Here it's from life to death. Yeah, for the ghost month first, in East Asia. Uh, well, this is on the seventh month of the Chinese lunar calendar. It's basically um, late August, early September for us. As uh, you can see up in the upper right-hand corner, this is in Taiwan, a, a poster uh, advertising ghost month. What happens? Well, the spirits of the ghosts and the spirits of the ghosts of the ancestors issue from the lower realm. So let's uh, look a look, have a look here and see what happens. Um, you know, a, a horror movie is only Hollywood can serve up. Um, 
But it does uh, stand as warning, I guess, of how rough things must be in China and Ghost Mountain, and maybe even in Arizona, uh, from the looks of the uh, background here in the movie. Well, uh, so how does all that happen? Well, on Ghost Day, the 15th day of the seventh lunar month, the gates of hell, uh, and the boundaries of heaven and hell are lifted so that the spirits that are free to roam the earth in search of entertainment. Uh, although I suppose entertainment is the eye of the beholder, uh, for the dead it might look like something else. is uh, sort of a, a Western sort of Christian overlay. Um, it isn't quite the same way in Asia. Yes, it can be foreboding, uh, but there, when, when you say something like the gates of hell open in a Western context, it, it uh, conjures images of prison, prince of darkness kind of stuff and demons, uh, which are then sort of smuggled into the film. Um, and it is true, as I was looking to, just reviewing again for this lecture, Sure enough, there was a news item in Southeast Asia of a boy who went swimming in Ghost Month. Not supposed to do that, apparently, and went missing. These are people who noted that uh, maybe it had something to do with, with, go with Ghost Month and, and the dead and the spirits. Although I'm sure that there are plenty of people who go missing all the time. Well, uh, the reason for all of this is familial piety. We already had that in the course thus far. This idea of honoring the dead, uh, the one's dead ancestors. Uh, the um, the crowning moment of Ghost Month is, uh, the, is, ghost, is the Ghost Festival. This is celebrated on the, east, on the eve of Ghost Day, always a full moon on the lunar calendar. Uh, families hold a feast, and they also make bird offerings of images and things that, uh, paint, paper mache, images of things that might be useful to the dead, appliances, and so forth, but also food. So let's have a look. The Hungry Ghost Festival is a month-long festival whereby Taoists and Buddhist communities burn paper effigies and present food offerings to the spirits of their deceased ancestors. The festival usually falls on the 15th night of the seventh month in the Chinese calendar, which is September 2nd this year. And according to traditional customs, it is believed that the souls of the dead roam the earth during the festival, and these ghosts can get up to mischief if ignored. To prevent this, all sorts of offerings are made during this period. You may have noticed people burning stacks of hell money and paper offerings such as cars, watches and jewelry outside their homes along the sides of roads or in fields. The offerings are made by the deceased family members to appease their ancestors and to care for their material needs, even in the afterlife. And as if satisfying the ghost's appetites for money and food wasn't enough, taking care of their entertainment is also important. A mainstay of the festival is a good time performance tour as a popular mode of entertainment for the wandering spirits. Large tents are set up in open fields to host raucous dinners and auctions. 
But with COVID-19, the celebrations have been confined to individual prayers and offerings by family members. On the last day of the festival on September 16th, the gates of hell will be closed. The festival will be observed again in the following year, on the 7th lunar month. concert during Ghost Month in Southeast Asia with the uh, the seats, the front row seats left for the dead. I think that's yeah, reserved for them in capital letters. Well, it's a history of Ghost Month. Well, it became a holiday during the uh, Tang Dynasty. We're going to get to the Tang Dynasty next week in the early Middle Ages. The custom was introduced to China from without um, and import by Buddhist monks and then promoted by Tang emperors. The emperor received the first fruits of the harvest, tasted them, and then would offer them to the ancestors. But then in the Chinese religion, you don't communicate directly with the gods, uh, but through your ancestors. Uh, the festival was compatible with native Chinese tradition, which had already associated this time of the year between the solstice and the fall equinox as the uh, season of harvest, darkening, and decay. And there was also those indigenous traditions of filial piety, which also fit snugly with, um, with Ghost Month and these Buddhist traditions. The tradition had originated in India. Uh, the seventh month is a month of joy for the Buddha and his monks, and in particular, the 15th day, a day of joy. Um, according to tradition, the Buddha sent out his monks during the three rainy months of the winter, excuse me, of the summer, uh, when they came back, one of the monks had perceived while he was out in the forest meditating that his father had been uh, released into the heavenly realm. That was the good news. The bad news was that he perceived that his mother had born, been born into the realm of the hungry ghost. Now you can see the hungry ghost there. Uh, the hungry ghost has a long, thin neck and a big belly. The neck is too long and delicate to swallow food but the, but the belly is big, so the hungry ghost is, well, perpetually hungry and kind of living in torment in this state. So uh, he, he also had perceived that the reason why she was cursed in this way was because she had been stingy in her offerings to the Buddhist monks. So he rectified that problem, and then he perceived that she had been born <coughs> as a dog of an opal family. And then after she lived out her life as a dog, she was then reborn again into a human existence. Uh, this is a 12th century Japanese manuscript. You can see a Buddhist monk there with a hungry ghost. And you can see the hungry ghosts have other problems too. Uh, it looks like a case of bad breath uh, of some sort uh, with these creatures. Uh, Japan, uh, we have the Bone Festival. So the Japan Day of the Dead, very similar to Ghost Month. By tradition, the 15th day of the seventh lunar month but was then fixed to August 15th once Japan decided to adopt the Gregorian calendar, the Western calendar. Um, it's a three-day Buddhist festival with banner reunions, cleaning ancestral tombs, oh yeah, um, details, details, the, visit, the dead also come and visit um, the family altars. And how do you celebrate? Well, it's kind of a carnival atmosphere. You can see with the pictures there, the, uh, the parade and fireworks, and then at the end, the launching of the illuminated boats. This is the launching of the raft to symbolize uh, sending the ancestors uh, back to the realm of the dead. So, the festival. Japanese. 
Uh, so let's have a look at, at, at the Bone Festival. Is this the other one? What's that? Here we go. <laughs> So there you have it, the uh, beautiful Japanese aesthetic um, to the Obon Festival. Pitru Paksha in India. Um, this is a Hindu festival to honor deceased ancestors with food offerings. It's a 16 day festival in the month of Vajrapada, which is late September, early October in our calendar. Um, it's spooky, the, the mood in life, spooky, auspicious, eerie, a little bit like Halloween. Indeed, Indian American cultural websites now are sort of pitching uh, uh, Pitru Paksha as the Indian Halloween. Well, three generations of ancestors require that the living relatives make offerings of food. This would be tradition, this is kheer, lapsi, lentils, and pumpkin, strangely enough, cooked in silver or copper vessels. If the if successful, the ancestors are released from the realm of the dead, the realm of Pitra Loka, uh, uh, the realm of Pitra Loka is ruled by Yama and released into the heavenly realm, ruled by Lord Indra. Uh, also, pendas, which are bowls made of wheat, barley, black sesame seeds, and ghee, are offered on the rooftop so that crows will come and eat them. It's believed that the crows come and eat them, that that means that the petitions for the ancestors have been accepted. Uh, also, the shraddha is performed. This is the, these are the death rites performed by the eldest male of the family. So you can see the middle picture is uh, performance of the shraddha, and then down below you can see a, uh, a crow enjoying the, 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 uh, the pendus. Ah, the deal of muertos. Uh, Central America, Mexico, also Latino enclaves uh, in the United States is where it's celebrated. On All Saints and All Souls Day, uh, its origins go back to ancient Mesoamerica. That's what we were dealing with on, on Tuesday. It's, um, uh, it was a festival uh, in August on the Aztec calendar. The ninth month, ninth month of the Aztec calendar would be August for us. This is uh, this um, the celebration is honored Mixtec Aswan, who is the queen of the underworld. The uh, celebration was moved uh, to where it is now by Christian missionaries when Mexico and Central America converted to Catholicism to bring it into alignment uh, with the Christian liturgical calendar. In other words, as a way of sort of co-opting the native tradition and then transforming and Christianizing it. But you can even see in the way that the two girls there are dressed with uh, uh, the painted faces and stuff is very much evocative of Mesoamerican and sort of indigenous tradition rather than, rather than anything explicitly uh, to do with Catholicism. Um, it's believed that the souls can most easily visit uh, the living on this day and to listen in on the prayers that are being said to them. So like some of these others we've seen, the um, 
uh, offerings of food are made, uh, candy pumpkins, sugar skulls, believe that the dead can feast on these things uh, and feast on their essence. And that if you, some believe that if a human being eats them, that they don't give you any kind of nutritional value because the dead have already sucked out the essence. And the living then also go to decorate the tombs to entice the souls to come visit. So let's have a look. The Day of the Dead has nothing to do with Halloween. It's called Dia de los Muertos. Today, in Mexico, families celebrate the Dia de los Muertos by preparing for the return of their loved ones. Dia de los Muertos wouldn't exist without the ofrenda, or the offering. It's a collection of saints placed on an altar to remember our loved ones who have passed away. Back at home, the ofrenda is created to welcome the spirits back. Food plays a huge role in helping pay respect to loved ones. A lot of the tradition of food and drink on the Isle of Muertos comes from a blend of Spanish and indigenous beliefs and practices. A common food item is pan de muerto, my personal favorite, or bread of the dead. It's a sweet and eggy bread shaped into people, animals, bones, and skulls. The sweet smell is said to help the dead find their families. The Spaniards are said to have brought the bread tradition to Mexico, but some say the design of the bread had roots to Aztec traditions. The bread is usually designed with four lines on top. Some say it represents the four cardinal points on the Aztec calendar. Others say the lines represent the bones of those who have died, and the center of the bread represents the heart or the soul. Other food in the ofrenda can include mole, fruits, and sweets. Drinks are put out too. There is pulque, a sweet fermented beverage made from agave sap. Pulque is sometimes mixed with nuts and fruits to make pulque curado. This drink was first drunk by the ancient Mesoamericans, like the Mayans and Aztecs. It was served at important religious festivals and celebrations. Campurrado is also a traditional go-to drink and also has roots to the Aztecs. It starts with a tole, a thin warm porridge made from corn flour, sugar, cinnamon, and vanilla. But then Mexican chocolate is added to it. You might also see fancy skulls decorated with colorful icing on the ofrenda. Those are calaveras de azúcar, or sugar skulls. They're made from a granulated white sugar mixture and decorated with icing. Even though the sugar is edible, the skulls aren't really made to be eaten. They're just a decoration. Sugar skulls weren't part of the ofrenda until the 17th century and were brought by Italian missionaries. The sugar skulls represent friends and family and sometimes have the name of the person on its forehead. Every ofrenda is different and specialized for each family member, but four important elements are needed. Water, wind, fire, and earth. Water is given to quench the spirit's thirst after their long journey. Candles represent the fire. Punched paper called papel picado represents the wind and the food represents the earth. All of these things make sure the dead will have everything they need for their journey back. that wasn't disturbing and creepy enough the first time. Uh, here, maybe that's a few more minutes, a uh, few more seconds. All right, day day, this is probably my favorite. Uh, this is the Haitian day of, day of the dead, a riotous blend of Catholicism and elements of West African religion, Vodou, brought to the Caribbean by slaves. Uh, it's on All Souls Day, uh, November 2nd. Revelers dress up in the uh, shabby uh, in the costumes of the shabby day days, these are the spirits of the underworld, or as Baron Somzi, uh, the cigar smoking, wine cracking, rum drinking, dirty joke telling, um, uh, day day dressed in a sophisticated tuxedo of white, black, and purple, uh, who mock death and offers protection from black ma magic and other kinds of hexes. So let's have a look at the Baron. Fresh. Who regards 
musical extravaganza we've cooked for you wonderful people. <laughs> So there you have it, uh, the Baron as a Bond villain. Uh, although I think for cinematic reasons they don't have him in black, white, and purple. They dress him up uh, differently for that. Although they did some done the painted face. The reason why you paint the face of white like that is it resembles skulls um, when you do that. Um, Haitians also make altars uh, uh, to the uh, to the gaydays, in, which include things like cigarettes, um, clarin, uh, which is a spice rum satin fabric, symbols of the Baron, and images of skulls. So let's have a look at a, at a, at a, um, at an altar. So there are also processions to the uh, tombs uh, uh, to clean them and leave offerings. And mystics called Hanguns and Mambos um, summon the dead uh, with drums and songs. Then the party starts. Sort of veritable New Year's Eve blowout from the dead. So where are we? Uh, let's take stock. Uh, Halloween to be clear by now represents just one pe peculiar expression of a general human obsession with life. Death, the afterlife, and the management of the dead and spirits. These festivals occur um, in conjunction uh, with the harvest and lunar cycles as the days begin to shorten. Or to say the darkness starts to increase. Food in all of these plays a crucial role. Uh, the juxtaposition of the death festivals with the abundance of harvest, uh, a reminder that life will inevitably be subverted by death for all of us. The association of food with life, we have to eat to live um, as life begins to ebb as we approach winter. The yearning of deceased loved ones uh, who might be helped by things that help us to live in the food offerings, the things that we need to live perhaps can help the dead. Um, the food, interestingly enough, is often sweet, perhaps a, a mark of, of life, uh, and sometimes includes pumpkin. Costumes and celebrations that then honor and mock death by their very liveliness, by their vivaciousness. So, finally, Halloween. Uh, Samhain. 
Solid is the Celtic festival in Ireland, marking the darkening of winter and is the direct antecedent of Halloween. It falls on October 31st, uh, the vigil of All Saints Day, and is called Halloween or Holland Tide. Uh, October 31st is the end of the farmer's year, uh, also called the Celtic New Year. The exact date of the holiday, a little bit like Mesa America, is unknown. It's possible that it was always here, but it's also possible that when this area, uh, when Ireland and Scotland were converted to Christianity, that the indigenous tradition was moved uh, so that it would be in, con in conformity with Christian practice. Um, All Saints Day. Uh, All Saints Day dates to the year 610. It was declared uh, a feast day by the Pope, not a general feast day. He was just more thinking about the area of Rome and around it. Uh, but in the uh, ninth century, Louis the Pious, Emperor of the Franks, son of Charlemagne, declared it to be a mandatory uh, feast day for all Christians. Um, all Souls Day, November 2nd, was added in the 11th century. Uh, these probably have something to do with the conversion of Europe. A lot of Western Europe had already been converted during the period of the Roman Empire, but Central and Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, Scandinavia, that was a project of the early Middle Ages, undertaken by the Franks, uh, and this extended into the 11th century. So it's not surprising <coughs> that All Saints Day and All Souls Day uh, between the 9th and 11th century would come online as major Chris Christian feast days as these Slavic and Scandinavian and Germanic peoples in Central Europe were being converted to Christianity as a way of absorbing some of the indigenous traditions and then reinterpreting them uh, as Christian ones. Uh, is Samhain a pagan Wiccan holiday? Uh, short answer, no, in the sense that it's impossible to know exactly what it was in pre-Christian times. There's not a scrap of evidence to tell us what it was. Wiccans today uh, celebrate Halloween as a Wiccan holiday and claim that it goes back to the time of the Druids, but we wouldn't necessarily know. It is true. There are lots of things that went on with Samhain that are not explicitly Christian and probably owe to whatever the culture was before the area was converted to Christianity, but it's impossible to know for sure uh, what its uh, precise outlines were. Here you can see in the background, this is a uh, sort of a Wiccan revival uh, Samhain festival in England in 2017. The customs, um, farmers in Ireland and Scotland by the state are supposed to have uh, harvested their grains, potatoes, turnips, and apples. Um, the cattle are supposed to be brought in from the moors close to home for safety. Winter wheat's supposed to be planted by the state and wood for the fires gathered. This was also the day for settling out wages and rents, traditionally. Fairs and markets were then also held. Here you can see in the painting, this is an early 19th century painting of Snap Out Night, or All Hallows Eve by the Irish painter. By an Irish painter, there you can see this was the singing, the dancing. Looks like there's uh, apple bobbing going on down here. The rituals, well, people processed to the graveyards uh, to place candles on the tomb because it was believed that on this night of all nights of the year, the dead were free, freest to roam the earth and visit the living. So lots of feasting and merrymaking, uh, meals of bread, butter, oat cakes, apple cakes, blackberry tarts, uh, with seats left at the table for the dead. Uh, gifts of apples and nuts uh, for children. Um, divination to foretell the future by burning shells and reading the ashes. Apple bobbing card playing, riddling, storytelling, more ominously, dares to go visit the old forts. <coughs> uh, the ancient ruins, the ring forts, the burial mound, that's the one you can see in the background there in East Ireland. These old prehistoric Iron Age forts that were places of dread. Bonfires were lit at night uh, to light the way for the spirits, but also to ward off the evil ones. Guising, groups of children dress up in dress up in grotesque costumes, um, mask and painted faces, uh, costly people or visiting homes, asking for gifts for Halloween parties, country boys roam the countryside and armed with clubs, uh, hit up farmhouses in the name of St. Columba. This is a saint who's uh, honored for having uh, been responsible for the conversion of Scotland, uh, asking for gifts of 
of, of uh, cheese and cake for Halloween parties, then there might be some good natured extortion. That is to say, asking for a gift in the name of Mokala so that uh, an invented pagan deity to ensure that the uh, farm remained prosperous. Hint, hint, it'd be a shame if something bad happened, uh, but I suppose if you give us some things, nothing will. Uh, pranking. Uh, pranks might be played on mean people uh, or people who had been mean to the geysers. Is this trick-or-treating? No, not precisely. Uh, this is, they certainly don't say trick-or-treat and it's not quite the same ritual. Um, and besides this kind of begging for food and so forth for parties went on throughout the harvest season. It was not specifically tied to Halloween. Let's have a look at Halloween in Ireland. Come to meet the royal county. Come and discover its rolling valleys of splendor. Experience the majesty of everyone. Enjoy the beauty of the Festival still going on. I just have the 2011 one because it's more entertaining advertisement. Um, and you can also see there in the advertisement the children dressed in costumes. You can even see in Ireland that Halloween has become already deeply Americanized. Uh, problems on Solomon? Well, all starts with the Dreaded Fairy, um, the inspiration for all the pranking. Uh, and then there are other denizens of the of the uh, supernatural world who are free to roam about. Um, you've got the Lady Gwen with her black pig. Lady Gwen is a headless apparition and goes around with a black pig. Uh, Ghost of the Dead, in general, most disturbing is Yulahan. This is the headless apparition. Uh, you see here on the left, this is Washington Irving's uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow set in New England. And this is the headless horseman chasing Ichabod Crane. But it's worth knowing that Washington Irving's mother was born in Cornwall, which is the Celtic part of England. And he wrote the story while he was uh, doing a stint in England. So presumably these sort of Dulahan uh, legends made their way into the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, one might also find dead relatives seated around the heart, you know, startlingly in the middle of the night. Let's well, who are the fairies? They say they're not Tinkerbell, uh, something more serious than that. They inhabit the old ring fort, um, where passersby on Halloween remark uh, on hearing the sounds of their revelry. They ruin crops, spit or urinate on them, blast their breath on them, causing them to wither. This is probably a sort of a, a mythopoeic interpretation of the withering effects of frost, but blaming it on fairies. Kill animals, and more distressingly, abduct mortals to fairy land. The fairies are the equivalent of elves in Norse mythology, which is a race of supernatural beings uh, believed either to be fallen, fallen angels or the ghosts of the pre-Celtic inhabitants of the British Isles. They're small, having been reduced um, to a diminutive size by repeated splashings of holy water and the power of Christianity. Um, in Iceland, Poll after poll, even now, still reveals a widespread, persistent belief in elves. So, let's have a look. Elves 
Kings and trolls hold a special place in the hearts of the people of Iceland. The tradition and mythology of the country's small folk dates back to the 10th century AD, when the first Norwegian Vikings settled on the island. Tales of elves were first mentioned in Iceland's medieval literature, and most of these epic poems of battles and encounters between elves, trolls, and Norwegian Vikings have survived partly because the Icelandic language has remained almost unchanged in more than a thousand years. The elves is something that we are actually brought up with. It's just a part of our mindset. It's not talked about whether we really believe they exist or not. It's just a huge part of our, our history, something that we grow up with. Uh, I don't know how they would do today. I think they would actually try and protect us. So they are so much part of our environment, whether or not they exist or not. Magni Skarpeyadinsson is a self-proclaimed elf and troll expert, as well as the founder of the country's first and only elf school. Well, according to my files, there are at least 13 different types of elves. They are from five centimeters up to meters. There are about three species of hidden people, which is totally human-sized people. And then we have gnomes and dwarves and fairies, which have wings, and we have trolls and a lot of other uh, invisible beings that sit, uh, who exist here. In the past two decades, he has collected hundreds of stories of alleged encounters between Icelanders and non-human entities. Well, these stones, uh, 1971, they were in the middle of a place where the highways are. And when the trade road company wanted to smash them because they wanted to build the highway, everything went wrong here. The workers were sick and the machines were all overheated and broke down. So in the end, the, the director of the company got a psychic man to give him a talk to the elves and hit me with his stones. Magnus claims that 54% of Icelanders believe in elves and trolls. I once saw an elf walking home from school. It was little, cute, and with colorful clothes. He was with other elves. They seemed happy and didn't talk to each other. They were just walking and jumping. I'm not so sure about the elves. For me, it's just a fairy tale. I used to believe in them when I was a kid. I thought I saw them back then. We always used to say, I saw an elf, but I think it was just about being a kid. Amidst century-old tin roof houses in the village of Stokseyri on Iceland's southern coast is Icelandic Wonders, a museum dedicated to elves and trolls where visitors can see replicas of elf dwellings. Reportedly, some tourists stay several days for free in exchange for posing as trolls and elves to scare visitors. <laughs> Rebecca Harrison comes from Oregon in the U.S. I believe in spirits and trolls. I think they are out there. Coming here strengthened my opinion that, yeah, there are spirits, trolls, ghosts, because to me, they're very similar. It's, it's very real here. You feel it. In the museum, there are nights I've been here and you feel spirit, there's somebody else in here. It's very strong here. Andres San Roman is a Spanish tourist who remains skeptical. La gente de aquí cree en ellos. People here believe in elves and goblins. Lots of them see trolls and other beings in this country. I don't particularly believe in it. But if they do, then there must be something about it. What is that possible? Whether they exist or not will keep people guessing for years to come. Don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that somebody's got a file on those elves. Um, <laughs> keeping track of them. Um, well, who are you going to call? Uh, you have a problem with the fairies? Uh, Ghostbusters are probably busy. Uh, but there are other things you can do. Um, um, no protection. A friend has been abducted three days from now. You're out having wings on Sunday. Uh, what are you going to do? You throw dust and you the state of fairies, and they'll be forced to give up in the abducted world. Oh, um, what's that? Uh, find them to throw this stuff. Oh, you just need a handful. Um, I suppose if it's raining, it would be a problem. Ah, uh, but that brings to point number two. Uh, they want you. Um, you can wear iron, a needle in your sleeve. Or in your collar. They hate that. I am repelled them. Um, disguise yourself. Turn your coat inside out. The fairies will run off in search of somebody else. They won't recognize you. Uh, the farm in your house is under attack. A uh, cross made of uh, straw above the door uh, will do the trick. 
Uh, the elves switch a baby with a changeling. Uh, that's pretty ominous. Sprinkle of holy water or oats on the forehead, forehead might, help, might help. Um, so here you can see in the previous picture, uh, slide, this is what's happening. This is a, a, a fairy taking away a human baby and has already put the changeling in the crib. Now you might think to yourself, is that a fairy? It looks like a demon to me. Well, that's only because by the logic of Christianity, that's all it can be. Uh, things either come from God or the devil, and if they're not from God, then that's where they come from. So fairies are then sort of, in a Christian context, they're sort of interpreted as kind of demonic creatures. Um, so if only that couple knew that holy water and a sprinkling of oats uh, would prevent all this and um, made it uh, past this tragedy. Uh, you see, that's a, that's a 15th century manuscript here, and, the, and you can also, um, also from the 15th century, you can use uh, charms. These are, uh, if you see in the background, which is a late medieval charm against demons and elves. The witches are hovering about. You take a pitchfork full of hay, light it on fire, and wave it over your head. Uh, keep them away from you. You try kindness. Um, off a of food is very host. Or if you're throwing out water, which they don't like to be splashed with water, uh, you say water toward you uh, so they can get out of the way. Or you can engage them, ask them to help in divining the future. But if you ask a, uh, a fairy or any other kind of uh, mischievous or evil spirit for that kind of help, it could be dangerous. So, which brings us to the tale of Stingy Jack. Uh -huh, I thought of that. Jack o' lanterns are everywhere this time of year. They adorn our yards and our stoops. Their gruesome faces light the dark nights leading up to Halloween. Some are goofy, some are grotesque. Where does this custom come from? Why do we choose to eviscerate helpless vegetables and burn their bellies? It's a story born of treachery and hellfire. It's the story of Stingy Jack. Ireland, long ago, old Stingy Jack, a blacksmith and notorious drunkard, was drinking at a local pub when the devil appeared before him. It's time, Jack, said the devil. Let's have one more, said Jack, so we may discuss this further. Very well, said Satan and he sat down. Jack ordered another pint. Satan had a drink with Jack. Time to go, Jack. Jack eyed Satan and said, I am without coin and cannot pay, but I have an idea. Why don't you shapeshift into sixpence so we can pay and leave this place? Satan agreed and changed into the requisite sixpence. Jack quickly slipped the devil into his wallet next to a silver crucifix, rendering the devil powerless. Satan was furious and demanded to be released from inside Jack's wallet. Only on the condition that you don't claim my soul for 10 years, Lucifer, said Jack. Satan agreed and Jack released him. With this treachery, Jack bought himself 10 more years. Ten years to the day, Jack was walking down a country road when Satan appeared before him. Time to go, Jack. Jack stalled and pointed out the apple tree on the path. Oh, Satan, allow me one more bite of juicy apple before I go. 
Satan nodded his assent. As you can see, my body is old and withered, Satan. Could you reach that most choicest of apples for me? When Satan was safely in the branches, Jack placed a cross at the bottom of the tree. Tricked again, Satan was furious and demanded to be released. Only on the condition that you never claim my soul, Lucifer. Satan agreed and Jack felt smug. Jack soon took ill and died a lonely death. Jack's soul ascended to the gates of heaven. Your eternal soul cannot reside here, said St. Peter. And so Jack was turned away. And so Jack approached the gates of hell where he was greeted by the Prince of Darkness himself. Let me in, Satan, said Jack. I'm sorry, Jack, but I must honor our agreement. I cannot claim your soul. But where am I to go, asked Jack. Back to Earth, Jack. Allow this hellfire to light your way. And so Jack inserted the hellfire ember into a hollowed out gourd. And it led his way back to earth, where he can still be seen on moonless nights. He, Jack, of the lantern. Christian Sisyphus. Yeah. <laughs> um. Alright, so how did we get from Ireland to America? Um, well, Halloween is true, appears after 840, uh, 1840, when Irish immigrants appear in large numbers in the United States. Um, yet it's also true that there were other traditions that flowed into Halloween. Um, medieval English soul taking, for example, of beggars on November 2nd, but at least the souls in purgatory, uh, developed into an oatmeal molasses treat on, on Halloween. Uh, soul taking was derived from uh, what often beggars would do in, in return for alms, but then uh, agreed to pray for the souls of the person who had given them alms. Then it turned into begging for a, uh, for a cake. And then from that point on, it, after that, it became sort of a ritualized treat, just simply made in general to celebrate the day. Guy Fox Day is acknowledged to be the second most important strand in Halloween after the Irish Solomon tradition. Um, this is the, uh, on November 5th in England, this is to celebrate the failed attempts of Guy Fox to blow up Parliament in 1605. Guy Fox is a Catholic, so it sort of turned into kind of anti Catholic. Um, uh, festival in England as sort of part of uh, English national identity from the early 16th century on. Uh, guising, dressing in costumes, bonfires, begging of children uh, for money to buy fireworks, and then you have Mystic Night, November 4th, the night before Guy Fawkes Day when children are pranked adults. Uh, this comes to see, comes to transpose to Halloween in American context where there's a Mystic Night on uh, October 30th before Halloween. And then there were other strands that probably left their little accent marks on Halloween. These various uh, master costume begging traditions of Europe, which kind of resemble trick-or-treaters. So you have begging in the name of St. Columb on Halloween, where you had that in Ireland. Uh, Christmas begging geysers in Poland, false faith beggars in uh, Switzerland, German soul taking, which is a bit like English soul taking. Uh, Schnorrs of Jewish Central Europe. Then there's some homegrown American traditions, begging of children in the late 19th and early 20th century for pennies at Thanksgiving in New York City, uh, costing children. And then also the ritual begging of Native Americans. 
where you can see uh, the the picture in the, uh, at the top is a reenactment of, of, of at least the making of soul cakes. And then down here is a 1788 broadside of Pope Night in New England. Uh, here you can see the Pope is here with uh, the picture of the devil behind. And then at the end of this thing, sort of an effigy, the Pope would be, would be burnt. Um, Halloween in Irish Americans. Well, prior to the 1930s, Halloween was celebrated. You have to put that in uh, surgical air quotes, uh, mostly in Irish enclaves. There were costume parties, apple bobbing, divination rituals of girls to see their future spouses. Boys, well, here's how one uh, observer in the Irish American community put it um, from the early 20th century. He says, uh, dress up parties and getting a future spouse were all well and good for girls, but they were not the essence of Halloween. The essence of Halloween for boys was robbery, destruction, arson. By the early 20th century, a characteristic uh, Halloween decor had come into view. Black hats, witches, ghosts, and jack-o'-lanterns. All this mayhem that would, have, would uh, happen on Halloween, especially the adolescent males, would be rationalized by adults as they're more for witches and go goblins. You might think of it as a way of sort of a release, a way to let uh, the um, uh, people to act out their resentments of one night of the year so that the rest of the year would be free from this kind of trouble. That is literally the plot of the purge. What's that? That is literally the plot of the purge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, but it's also true that neither the phrase trick or treat nor the ritual linking of begging um, and of, of, excuse me, that linking of threat and reward was widely known uh, before the 1930s. You can see this is a picture of the 1880s of a, of a Halloween party in the Irish American community. Uh, just briefly, here are some early 20th century postcards. And you know, what the boys do to the cow, you figure it's just some of the tricks on Halloween. This is the more benign form, uh, putting two jack lanterns on the horns of a cow. Uh, this is a young girl getting a look at her, uh, who will be her future spouse. And then you have this one here. I mean, can you imagine making this into a, into a postcard that you might send to somebody? Two boys beating up a younger boy on Halloween. Which I think sort of sums it up for the experience, I guess, of adolescent males on Halloween in the early 20th century. Well, uh, by the time you get to the Great Depression, this kind of rambunctiousness and acting out was seen to be dangerous, given all of the social tensions and the stresses uh, and the economic insecurities of, of the time. Um, moral scolds and days about the Halloween problem. Businesses, local governments decided to do something about this kind of rowdyism that they said, quote, fostering a carnival spirit within the bounds of decency. Um, homemakers were now advised to invite in the tricksters, offer them a treat, donuts and cider, um, as a way to sort of discipline all the fun on Halloween. Ritualized uh, begging for treats now seen as ideal for Halloween, which had always been a venue for resentment going back to the 19th century. Um, interesting enough, and so the irony here is that uh, regular banking was discouraged as a reminder of wealth inequality during the Depression, but here this ritualized form considered now ideal. Um, this taming of Halloween continued apace into the 1950s uh, with the commodification of Halloween. The tricks part of trick-or-treating basically vanished. Treats were replaced by the commodities of manufactured costumes and candy, like this one. Came from a spirit of Halloween store. Uh, you can see those all in the next area, but the candy aisles uh, full of candy. Even the Irish have gotten in on the act here. At least the Irish Brewing Company now has their black pig, Irish dry, uh, dry stout. Remember the black pig is one of the, um, the apparitions allegedly running around on Halloween with the Lady Gwen. The disconnection of Halloween from community um, was accelerated in the 1970s and 80s with bogus tales of poison cookies, razor blades, and apples, um, confirming the uh, reliability of trusted name brand companies. In other words, you really can't trust your neighbors, but you can trust Mars and Hoshi uh, to give you a treat. For all that, trick or treating can still be dangerous, so let's have a look.
we do now? We meet our days. Jack-o'-lanterns. Why are we here? To pay our respects to the dead? The Halloween school bus massacre. famous in the Detroit metro area in the 1990s and early aughts. But it's a much more, it's a widespread phenomenon, not just particularly here. Um, now it's in a bit of, of remission, but you never know. The problem is, uh, the thing with Halloween is, given its history and its association with uh, as being a venue for resentment, uh, you never know when uh, Mischief Night will burst forth again. Well, what have we become? Uh, we used to be the arsenal of democracy, not the arsenal of confectionery. Uh, uh, Halloween, for all the worries of some quarters that it's some kind of a devil worshiping holiday, is really nothing of the sort. It's a secular holiday that fetishizes production and consumption. American business now does the work of the religions of old. Just as we've seen of religions that sort of co opted other cultures and transformed them, in a sense, this is what's happened with big business which has co-opted and absorbed these indigenous traditions, co-opted Halloween, uh, Halloween included, and transformed them. The capital ethos um, has transformed all of these traditions of, of various immigrant strands in the United States that flow to Halloween from Africa, Europe, Asia, Mexico, now into marketing bonanza that's second now only to Christmas. And like traditional religions, um, American culture, and especially American capitalism, is missionary. So much so that even American style Halloween has displaced White Fox Day as a holiday in England. But what must it have been like uh, to fear the Duma uh, to um, live in anxiety? Uh, and trepidation about the approach of the ferry boat. Uh, to worry, to wake up in the middle of the night and find your end, uh, to find the dead seated around the table. That at least sounds much more fun than the current candy grab. And yet, for all of that, for all of the taming and the commodification, Halloween still is a subversive holiday. Costuming and imagery, focusing of a world only on death, death and mortality, you might say, something that is deadly serious to us, despite all of the fun that surround Halloween. Um, a topic, say, that still makes us quite uncomfortable. So stay tuned, because Halloween keeps changing as American society and American culture changes. So uh, that concludes the lecture. You all have a wonderful Halloween, um, Sunday Sunday. Uh, just a, a, a word about you have your quiz due uh, Friday night. Just a, a word warning. 
I think of it this way. I, on, on the first quiz, you know, as I said, you should have full answers. You know, develop your answers a bit. Think of it this way. If, when we've done essays in this class, there are three points. And those are one-page essays. This thing is worth 10 points. So if you want a good rule of thumb for maybe about how much you should develop your answers, maybe something like three pages would be a good one, because it's eight questions. And it, it, that would give you, you know, a good paragraph for each question would probably come up to about that length. So that's just a, um, a, a rule of thumb to think about and what to shoot for if you're worried about how much you should say. Or put it another way, if it's too short, you're probably not saying enough. And I, there were some issues with that with some of you in the first quiz, so be aware of that here with the second. Alrighty, um, see you on Tuesday and as